Hi, I would like to read a chapter from Occultosophia, proving that there's a beast in all of us. So, lovely cannibals, civilized beasts. Angels are not created from light, but from sublimation of animals into the divine, or the divine that lends itself into the world and creates a mask from its inseparable totality. The divinity is not in contradiction with nature. Lux ex nox umbra et imago. Now, the shadow in Jungian understanding can be a proportional image of the psychic constellations that are repressed by their consciousness. It differs between individuals, cultural groups, civilizational groupings. It is a representation structure of variable inverted fragments or whole complexes as clusters of images and affect and thoughts. It can be fixed on condensed experiences, coexist, a symbol, an image, an affect, a thought, an action, a trauma. To understand it better, let us give a banal example. The original hominid cannibal and participation mystic, as opposed to a civilized English gentleman. The ancestry of this English gentleman can be retracted back to a cannibal. Cultural genetic factors have retrained and rebuilt the entire psychic apparatus along the chronology of mimetic social logos mutations between the two gentlemen. The shadow appears to be both chronological and chronic. In the high values of the gentleman, the instincts of the cannibal look through the small cracks of civilization. There is always a monster under the bed of the conscious mind. The English gentleman will not return to this stage savage cannibal who is more animal than human. Nevertheless, he can meet him. He encounters the psychopathological shadow of this old Kronos in his own mind. Under certain circumstances, he encounters insidious emotions, instincts, impulses that are severely repressed or non-conscious. These so-called sins of humanity are interpreted through his modern rules, codes, cognitive, behavioral and socialized functions. They are fetishized and moralized into pure and impure as his conditioned conscience dictates to him. As such, the true Kronos will turn into a criminal, a serial killer, not a terrible infant terrible of nature. Evaluation creates the divide, not nature itself. Now, the English gentleman might see this cannibal in a modern setting as something abhorrent, not to say a freak of nature, a murderer, a man to be condemned and judged. Now, the true archetype of all people is not the symbol, but the totality of their archetype from which types and symbols are derived. Inventiveness in delineating archetypal symbolism is merely a categorical Aristotelian hiccup. The archetypes invented by Jung are a fragment of the modern desire to tame a primordiality into categories. As models, they are nice and beautiful, they evoke aesthetics, but they are utterly useless when it comes to understanding psychopathology and behavior across epochs. It is behavior that creates the historical image, not the other way around. Austin Osmond's doctrine of recurrent atavism is much more effective in explaining this, namely the idea that the human mind contains atavistic memories that have their origin in earlier species on the evolutionary ladder. These atavistic memories may also be neurogenetic engrams of instinctual biopsychological homuncula, that is mental images of the body, deposits triggered like for example IRM, IRM's innate releasing mechanism in animals. The IRM is a mechanism that somehow encodes the behavior of animals that simply know what to do when something happens. They know what to do when they are born, when they crack the egg, when they behave in their natural environment. Without resorting to species consciousness, which I personally like as an idea, let us focus on something else. Expressed genes that build the organism make it tend to behave in certain ways. This may give the impression of genetic memory because it seems like black magic. More likely, however, these are potentials that manifest in reality through an organism's sophisticated, complex adaptive system in the environment into which it seamlessly fits. It is often forgotten how closely interwoven life is with its environment. Millions of years of evolutionary adaptation and entropic factors come into play here. Now, the shadow of female desire as an instinct may be represented as a spider, so it is fear, fearsome and deadly. The shadow of the male lust, primordial lust, can be a worm, helpless, blind, and invading the earth with uncontrolled lust, Durand's idea. 
It is not a mere association. In the nervous complexes, it generates horror and nightmares of insects and lower ectonic bugs. Libido is an ancient instinct. It is the conveyor belt of reproduction and life itself. Therefore, it is associated with primitive life forms, lava, insectoid, embryonic, on the neurocranial evo devo scale. Now, what I want to posit is that ancient Greeks believed that there is a certain element of Tartarism within all of us, a certain element of evil. And the human nature is neither good nor evil. It is strained via culture, civilization, sophistication of the socialization processes and so on and so on. But whomsoever thinks that he is a civilized person with no evil within him is wrong. Because in given circumstances during the confrontations, he may actually see that his nature is not what he taught, and that this beast is coming to the fore through civilizational structures. He won't become a cannibalistic, primitive, murdersome hominid in any way, or an animal. No, no, no. That is sublimated through a variation of civilizational values in all forms of indeficiencies. That also means that evolution is not perfect and our minds and natures are not perfect. We may be trained, we may pitch to the divine, but that is a hard, hard work and task, an ordeal, so to say, to break the beast within and to sublimate it into the greater world. That's why I don't like people who castrate mm, divinities as the benevolent lord because it's all a lie, and don't contradict nature, they're sublimated into divinity. And human animals must pitch themselves and train themselves, continuously combating this primordial element within. And the more advanced they become, the more sophisticated their natures, the reason their intelligence, the more they should be aware of that pull of the beast, the pull of the bestial. Because it is an element that is growing with our sophistication, with our intelligence and reason, and takes on new forms. The Tartarism is being submitted or being broken by Tartarism means being broken by all the impulses. And if a man is a let's say, a primitive person, a, a simpleton, he might indulge in all forms of cruelties that are vulgar and stupid and uh, just destructive. If he is a sophisticated man, like some political psychopaths, they have a certain measure of civilizational training, reason, and so on and so on. That doesn't prevent them from filtering out the speciality of the both vulgar and the primordial, they turn it into a highly sophisticated machine of ignorance, of evil, of delusion, of attachment, and so on and so on. And they are so enclosed in it with the support of societies that they are not aware of what malignant forms of government they are engaging in. And because most societies are used to this treatment, they can see through it. As a word of uh, perspective. Thank you.